seen in the architecture profession since you started that have been significant? Hmm. Well, fundamentally, it's the same. And it's hmm. been the same for a very long time. But I'd say it's hard to avoid talking about the computer because it right. changes the way you do everything, starting with drawing. Uh, you know, we haven't given up pen, pen, we have not given up pencil and paper. It's necessary to think, but all the drawings are made on computers, and there's a way of building a computer drawing that's completely different than building a drafted drawing. It's the way we communicate. There's that great New Yorker cartoon, just like last week or two weeks ago. The man with one of those dog collars on, you know, those plastic cones. <laughs> right. He's at a cocktail party, and he said, I'm wearing this so I don't constantly check my smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> You know, right. it manages the way we use our time. It's 24-7. <laughs> we need uh, to get some of those. <laughs> Maybe they can supply those cones for us. Uh, it's, it's the way we present to clients. We used to show them only renderings, only flat drawings. Now we show them movies. <laughs> you know, it's a movie of the house. Um, it's the way we create information and are able to share it with other people. We make boatloads of information because it's easy. And we can broadcast it everywhere because it's easy. We can research anything. So I mean, the world's gotten incredibly small, um, but it hasn't made us smarter. We don't go any faster. <laughs> uh, we're not any more creative. We just have um, a big pile of information. You know, we're swimming in a bigger pile of information. And just different tools, right? We type. We don't draw. Right. <laughs> That's interesting. So how do you get inspired? I love buildings, so I'm always looking. You know, the really great new building, ordinary buildings, ugly buildings. I look at them all. Um, and I always have what I'm working on on my mind. So, you know, there's some problem I'm trying to solve on a project, and I'm looking around. I'm looking for things that are going to trigger a solution to that problem that I'm thinking about. Do you travel, though, to look for that? Or is it things you I like find? To yeah, everywhere? I like to travel. I, and you know, I, have my, I have my favorite places to go. You know, Europe is, I, I, like, I like old cities. So you can go to Charleston or Savannah. You can go to small cities anywhere in Europe. And uh, I can be very inspired there. That's great. I had a client once who said, um, design is a blessing and a curse. And what she meant by that was that wherever she goes, she wants to fix everything. Because there's a lot to look at that she doesn't want to look at. <laughs> Do you find that? That you want to erase a lot of things? Yeah, I get mad. Do you? I just, why does this have to be like this? <laughs> right. So it's a, it is a curse in that way. So you, you talked about sort of Bunny being somebody who brought you business early on. Um, have you had sort of one patron client that you've done multiple homes, and how many have you done? We have quite, we're really lucky this way. We have a lot of repeat business. We have people that come back. We have entire families that come back. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this, is, this is kind of a great story. Our very first client, Bunny had decorated their New York apartment. We were just, think, you know, we were just starting to get the idea of our company off the ground. And she said, Mark, you know, I'd like you to meet this person. He wants to do a little addition on the side of his house. You know, it's, a very, it's very modest. The house is modest, the, addition, the project's modest, but I think, I think this would be good for you. So we met, we did the project. This client we've done, we've completed, I think, seven projects for, wow. and uh, as recently as a year ago. So it was a really great way to, <laughs> we've been really lucky. <laughs> yeah. And we owe this, this family a, a really big time. <laughs> for being loyal for such a long time. You know, I think that that's the secret that you don't hear in a lot of firms, is that there are these patron clients that really keep the bread and butter moving because there's that loyalty factor. Yeah. And then when you get really well established, then suddenly you're doing their children's homes, and it, it goes generation to generation. There are serial builders out right. there, and you know they always have a project on their mind, and it's it's as much about the journey as it is the destination. And those are the really interesting ones. Mm -hmm. So how do you choose your clients? We don't. They choose us. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> we're op we're op opportunistic. Um, if somebody comes to us with a proposal and we think we can do it, we say yes. Not all proposals are reasonable. 
and not everybody's nice about it. But, <laughs> but we're professionals. So you're talking about how you pick your clients, but I think that ultimately you, you are privileged with the fact that you do get to say no every now and then, right? Very rarely say no. And to be honest with you, we say, we, yeah. You don't even get the conversation to the point where you have to say no. Hmm. You just say we're really busy right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. it, it, maybe you should try us in four, four months, something like that. Or we're not really the right firm for your project. Yeah. But have you ever said we're really busy right now and regretted it? Yes, and we were really busy, and it was a family. It was a, it was, it was a member of a family that we've done a lot of work for, and we had to say no because we did. We thought we would fall down, and we referred the client to a colleague. I'm sure the project turned out beautifully, mm -hmm. um, but we regret having to do that. Was it the regret more about the project or about sort of keeping the legacy of the client? The loyalty. Going? The loyalty. They're loyal to us. We want to be yeah. loyal to them but we just couldn't muster the resources. Yeah, that's great. And have there been clients that you wish you said no to? Or that <laughs> yes. you're too busy? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like professional sports. You win some and you lose some. Right, yeah, I think we've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's hard, because you know, in this profession we always think, where's that next client gonna come from? And so we wanna say yes, and you always think, well, they say it's a crappy little project, but in truth, it could be something more than, clients are not always honest about the You make some project. big commitments in the first few hours of a relationship with a client. So everybody's working on intuition and instinct, is this going to work? And everybody's on their best behavior. So you have this little honeymoon where everybody says yes, <laughs> and then you get down the road and you do the best you can. Right. So, being that we're in a school, let's talk about education. Do you okay. think that the students today should learn more about the business side of design? I'm conflicted. I think, of course, yes. Um, talking to me, too, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but, but we're artists. We don't, we don't cotton to business class. It's really hard to, to appreciate how that might be useful to you at some, at some point. Um, I tuned out, I, my business class was, in, in my first business class, I always told Mark, you know, an architect spends about 10% of their time on design. The other 90% is getting the, just getting the work done, implementation. At that point, I tuned out. I said, wow, I, how am I going to do this? <laughs> <All right. laughs> you know, maybe I want to be an academic or something like that. Uh, but I do think entrepreneurship can be taught and should be taught in school, in design school. And what I mean by that is, you know, how you build an organization, how you put it on a mission, you know, how, how to make a business plan, how to market a product or a service, how to sell something, and particularly for architects, because I think we're disadvantaged. Unlike our colleagues, decorators, and contractors who deal in tangible things, they make things and they can, you know, they can pass you a thing that you can touch. We're dealing in abstractions and promises. It's a bunch of words <laughs> until the building is built. Right. And so I think we have to work extra hard to be uh, clear and reassuring to clients so that there's an understanding about the promise that we've made. Yes, and you know, I think that the number one attribute or relationship sort of builder is trust. And mm -hmm. to get there, it takes time and they have to believe in you, they can look at your magnificent work and say, well, they can do that. In the beginning, you don't have that to show people, so it's really a trust factor. And when you don't have a client's trust, you can totally tell that, and the project shows that. I had a very interesting experience where a client uh, who's a developer, so understands real estate, uh, had worked with other architects, commissioned us to design a house, and it wasn't until they moved into the house and he said, Mark, you know, this is perfect. It's everything that I expected and more. But you know what? I've been nervous and anxious the entire time because I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know how it's going to feel. I don't know how big it's going to be. You know, how's it going to look from down the street? So it's huge anxiety until the th you're done. The big <laughs> even, even among seasoned clients. 
Yeah, it's that big reveal. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I have to say, and I've had the privilege of being at installations with clients and watching their clients walk through the door and the emotional sort of one relief, but also just joy in that, wow, I never thought I could live like this. It, it, that's the moment that all of this becomes worthwhile. Yeah. And it's usually more than all the promises in the beginning, because all that stuff is, it's just, it's bits and pieces, it's abstract. But right. when it does come together and you can walk into the environment, yeah, it's, it's. So what changes do you think that are inevitable for this profession? Some things are going to stay the same. You know, human nature is the same. Places that we live in are not going to change very quickly. I think what, um, and architecture follows culture, follows, I think, follows society. Mm -hmm. And I think society these days is driven a lot by engineers, scientists, business people, you know, computers, cars, airplanes. All that stuff is science and technology oriented. And I think architects, some architects are trying to keep up with that. And we can't keep up. We do something different. And I think that if architects focus on preserving and enhancing what's human in the environment, you know, what's, what's enduring, that we might be doing a better job. I think of an architect as, as like a value investor, you know, like Warren Buffett. You know, they're all, they, they are sitting tight, you know, looking for the long-term trends. They're very rigorous in their analysis, and they know that when they make an investment, that in the, somewhere down the road, it's, it's going to blossom for them. And I think an architect has to th think about that too. What are, the, what are the enduring principles and enduring qualities that a building should have that 50 years from now, mm -hmm. it's gonna be something that somebody wants to preserve, wants to fix up, wants to make better? Well, and it's not disposable. Right. Right. And I think that's the problem we've had for many years is that people think of it as disposable. Some do. We live in a fast world. Right. <laughs> Got to change it. Yeah. Um, who have you admired most? Any profession? Oh wow. Uh, there are so many. Um, but I'll, uh, in history, Edwin Lutyens, English architect from the turn of the century, uh, a self-taught architect, incredibly talented, a prodigy if prodigies exist in architecture, and somebody who married a vernacular architecture and uh, classical principles in a very unusual way, uh, very uh, individual to him, but things that seemed incredibly rooted to the place. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to visit a, a lot of his buildings all at one stretch, and you could see that they really resonate with the other buildings that they're with. They're not, they're not they weren't exotic flowers. Mm. They weren't these pure creations of his imagination. They were really rooted to the tradition of building in these places. And I find that very compelling and hope that there's something of that going on in our work. Well, if you want to get it, move it up a little bit to a more contemporary person, I'd say Leon Creer, who's determined to preserve the European city, the traditional European city. And, He's been very provocative with building designs, writing, drawings, you know, at, at, to promote using vernacular and classical architecture to preserve and enhance a traditional city. I find, and I think that his work back in the 70s when I was in school was really instrumental in beginning this interest in traditional architecture, mm -hmm. and, you know, the interest in classicism that. Uh, that we have today. So I think he's a very important figure. I'd say close up, mm -hmm. you know, the people I work with, sometimes even clients. I had a client, very difficult project, lots of people having something to say about it. He's a CEO of a successful New York company and just watching him work, get everybody to get on board to reach a consensus that was going to move the project forward was um, uh, very uh, inspiring to me. Mm -hmm.